Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ask Shane Anything. This show is a reward for those of you who pledge at $7 or more per month at patreon.com slash sifted. Now actually, it's a reward for everybody. Everybody gets to watch the show. However, if you want to ask questions, you have a much higher chance of getting your question in the show if you're pledging at $7 or more per month. My guess is... A bunch of you guys are still playing Baldur's Gate 3 this weekend, and I hope I can be your podcast that rides shotgun while you play it. Let's get to today's questions. First up for this week's episode is a question from Bachby. What are your thoughts on developers saying people can't expect their games to be as awesome as Baldur's Gate 3? They're careful to say nothing anything against Larian, but I can't help but notice that they seem a bit salty and jealous, forgetting that Larian did not start out as a 400-person team. Okay, this is a great question. It's very timely. Even though you actually asked it like a week or two ago, um, the timing is right for right now um, to answer this question. And I think I need to clarify things first for people so they know what's going on. So let's see. Baldur's Gate 3, it's about to come out. It's starting to build a ton of hype. Things are starting to leak out that it's like this next level RPG. And other developers in the industry, not all of them, but some developers in the industry started to get a little bit defensive. So the first thing that happened was a smaller RPG developer. I'm not going to call them out because I'll be honest with you. I don't think that they really said anything wrong. A smaller um, RPG developer just basically came out and said, look, like, don't expect this from us. (laughs) They were like... We don't have the team size, the resources, the budget, etc. to create an RPG as awesome as Baldur's Gate 3. And so we need to do what we can do within our budget to make great games for you guys. I'll be honest with you, I'm totally fine with that. He's just being honest. He's just setting realistic expectations for his game, the game that he is working on. He's saying, look, man, like we don't have 400 people to work on our game. So don't think that every indie action RPG or every indie RPG that comes out from now on is going to be as good as Baldur's Gate 3. Again, I don't see a big problem with that. The problem arose, however, when developers from big publishers, or at least developers who are working on games with big budgets started chiming in. There was a developer from Diablo 4 who basically said they're playing on a different playing field than us because what what's happened is that Baldur's Gate 3 is a great game that doesn't have any of the stuff in it that a lot of modern players hate like microtransactions and battle passes it's just a great single player RPG done and they're not trying to milk their customers for extra money after the game comes out now could there be story dlc for Baldur's gate 3 eventually it could happen even if and i'm not sure about this i don't know but even if larian has come out already and said we're not doing any dlc for Baldur's gate 3 that can change we've seen developers and publishers say that about games and the game's a big big success and they change their mind that's not what we're talking about though we're talking about the predatory stuff the microtransactions the publishers trying to leech more money out of its fans after the fans have already spent a big chunk of money buying the base game the developers who are making games like that, who they say are being, they're being forced to do things like that by the publishers. But here's the thing, like Larian is its own publisher. Why? It was very smart in how it managed its money. It started out as a very small developer, 40 or 50 guys working on games, and it built its revenue up over time. It got better at making games and therefore it made more money on games. And it's it's all culminated in Baldur's Gate 3. Were there 400 people working on Baldur's Gate 3? I'm not 100% sure. I don't know. But even if there were, Larian didn't start that way. It started like one of the little guys, which was the first person that I talked about, who was saying, like, don't expect this from us. But I would say, buddy, like, if you play your cards right, like Larian did 10, 15 years from now, you could be making Baldur's Gate 3. So Larian is a masterclass in how to manage a an independent developer Um, over a long period of time so that it no longer becomes this little indie studio that can't make big budget games. So I think there's just a, to your, I guess the word that you use is salty and jealous. I, I agree with that. I do think some of these developers are salty and jealous because they aren't working at Larian. (laughs) They're working someplace like Activision where they're like, oh, we're going to squeeze every penny 
out of our fans. <laughs> and that's not what Larian has done. And consequently, people love Baldur's Gate 3. At some point, we're going to get to a tipping point where these publishers of big budget games like Blizzard, Activision, EA, etc. are going to realize that you will make more money if you just make a great single player product and don't put any of the other garbage into the game. It will sell maybe an extra 5 million copies and you'll make more money than if you strung the game out and tried to milk every penny out of your fans. So Larian has done everything right with Baldur's Gate 3, not just with the development and managing its finances throughout the years, but also how it utilized early access. That's probably another thing that these big developers are salty over is that they can't put their game into early access and leave it there for two years and get all this feedback from fans and make the game better. There are kind of separate rules for indie versus big publisher because I'll be honest with you, I feel like if Bioware were to release one of its big RPGs into early access two years before it was released, I do think that most people would trash the game. Instead of saying like they do with indie developers, oh, this is early access, it's supposed to be broken and we're supposed to help make it better, when you start dealing with like big publishers, for whatever reason, a big percentage of players suddenly change their thinking. Suddenly they're like, oh, I don't know, like, should we be playing this Dread Wolf like two years early, even though it's broken? Like, it feels like when people buy games from big publishers, they expect them to be finished and polished the day that they release. And there's a little more leeway given to the indie guys. Now, I'm not you saying this to try to forgive any of the things developers have said about Larian or Baldur's Gate 3 at all. I am explaining maybe why the developers at these big publishers are a little salty and jealous, as you put it, because it does seem like they're kind of playing by different rules from what Larian is. So, as usual, nothing is ever as simple as it seems when you first hear about a story. But the truth of the matter is, like, the guys working at these big developers should either shut up or move to a studio like Larian where they can do exactly what they want. Hi Next up, we have a question from Gregor G. Now that it's summertime, I've had some spare time to clean out my closet of old unused video game consoles. I have an unused Wii and Xbox 360, which I most probably will never turn on again. Yet, I still want to keep them around because it seems wasteful to throw them out. I understand that you also have a lot of unused stuff in your closet, so my question is, what is your future plan with all of those consoles and games? Are you hoping to sell them for money or just keep them around to trigger fond memories every time you happen to look at them? Okay, Gregor, the first thing I'm going to say is that my feelings on this stuff are evolving. <laughs> And they continue to evolve, and that's okay. I say this all the time on Ask Shane Anything. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay to evolve your opinion based upon new evidence or a change in your lifestyle or the lifestyle of someone that you live with or whatever, or just the lifestyle of life in general. It's okay to change. And I have been changing on this. So for the longest time, um, I was a collector, and I you know, pound the desk for physical games. I still pound the desk for physical games, I'll be honest with you. Um, there is value there. You can sell those games. You can share those games. Um, so there is added value to physical media, so I still stand behind that. But I am a little more understanding of people who choose to not take part in physical media. I guess I'll put it that way. So I'm sitting here in this apartment, the same apartment I've been in since I launched Sifted. You know this room by now. Um, but that bed that's behind me right there, underneath it, it is packed with stuff. There's a closet right out here, packed with stuff. There's a closet right over here on my left-hand shoulder, packed with stuff. The rest of the closets in the place, the wife gets. <laughs> but my closets have been full for years now, and I've had no space um, to add anything, which I honestly feel like has been good. I've found that I'm not buying frivolous stuff. I don't buy things on a whim because everything that I buy, I'm like, where am I going to put that? Or what am I going to take out of my closet to make space so that I can put that? Otherwise, stuff is just piling up in the apartment and that is not going to fly with me or the wife. So I've been kind of just organically put on like, I don't know, suspended from buying stuff for quite a while. And over the course of that amount of time, I realized I don't need that stuff. <laughs> I think I read a rule one time. It's like, if you don't touch something for five years, throw it away. I agree with that. Like, if, if, if it's something that you, you're you keeping because you think you're going to use it, if you haven't used it in five years, you're probably not going to use it. And even if you do eventually use it, like, once, 
it wasn't worth the seven or eight years of storing that thing to use it once. So my plan all along, I don't really get attached to physical stuff. My plan all along for my gaming stuff was to wait until I'm ready to retire in 15, 20 years or whatever and sell it all. And hopefully all the stuff that I've bought in Japan and everything will have increased in value to the point where, you know, maybe I make enough money off selling all that stuff so my wife and I can go on a couple vacations or something. Like, I'm obviously not expecting to get rich because one thing I realize is even the most rare gaming stuff, it doesn't increase in value all that much. So when I was going to Japan a lot, I would go to the Pokemon Center. And every time I go to Japan, I go to the Pokemon Center and I would buy whatever Nintendo handheld that they had for sale at the time. Because the Pokemon Center handhelds, they make a very limited run of them. Um, and if you're not in Japan, they're hard to get. So as an American coming back here with that stuff, you think it increases in value. The most valuable handheld that I have, and I've been collecting stuff from Japan for 20 years now, is worth like $1,500. And I'm sure you're like, but Shane, you paid $200 for it. Now it's worth $1,500. That's a lot. It's not that much money. <laughs> um, when you live in LA, that's like not even half the, a month's rent. So to put it all in perspective for you, it's like, or for myself even, I'm not going to have like a nest egg for retirement from all this stuff. And yet... I keep dragging it around. Like I dragged a bunch of stuff from Philadelphia out to San Francisco. And then I collected a bunch of stuff in San Francisco. And then I moved it all down to LA in my first apartment that I lived in. And I had it all there. And I got robbed, by the way, and lost so much stuff in that apartment. I was gone for the holidays. I came back. Someone had busted in my apartment and left the window hanging wide open. And my cat, it was like two weeks. My cat was in there with, that, with the window broken and she never jumped out. I mean, losing the gaming stuff sucked, and ha having your place broken into, there's like this violating feeling that you get. The worst part was the cat. My cat could have just jumped out and just ran away, and I never would have seen her again. Um, so anyway, I had all that stuff there, and then I moved it over to this apartment. I've been living in this apartment, and all this, in this part, my, it filled up. It's like, at the end of the day, I'm asking myself, was it worth it keeping all this stuff around to sell it when I'm in my 60s for five or $10,000? I mean, that's a calculation you need to make for yourself. If you own a home, you probably have more storage. You have an attic. You have a garage with some rafters maybe where you put some plywood and you can put stuff up. There. It's different for you than it is for me, I'm sure, or for a lot of people. But for me personally, someone who has to live in an apartment and has run out of space, I have lost the collecting gene. I don't, when I see things now, I'm not like, I want that. I need that. That will be worth money someday. I've kind of fallen off. But you're probably younger than me. There's plenty of time for you to build your little collection that you can sell when you're ready to retire. However, I do feel like with physical media kind of going away, that becomes more difficult by the day. So I guess what I would say, um, what is my future plan? I'm going to stick to the plan. I'm going to keep all my stuff. And I even thought about selling stuff on Sifted in our store, like selling some of my rare stuff in there. Um, maybe even like doing a consignment thing where if you guys have rare stuff and you're looking to sell it and you don't want to pay 30% to eBay, maybe you can sell it on Sifted in our store. Anyway, it's something I've been thinking about. Um, and in fact, you know, comments below, let me know what you think about that idea. The big problem there obviously is verifying the sale because if somebody buys something and then they get it and, you know, they just call their credit card company and they're like, I never got it. I want my money back. And they do the charge back on a $1,500 handheld that can't be replaced. It's tough. That's why you pay eBay the 30% because they cover your butt. But let's be honest, eBay does not cover the butt of the sellers. It sides with the buyer every single time. So anyway, just something to consider. Um, if you guys might be interested in like selling some of your rare stuff through Sifted as a consignment type thing, let me know. Hi Next up, we have a question from JPZ311. Shane, with Epic Battle Axe shutting down its website, I was just curious how they got picked up by game trailers and your relationship with them. Okay, the first thing I will say is I love the Epic Battle Axe crew. They are good people. They're actually awesome people. Um, as you pointed out, I have known them and dealt with them on and off for, I don't know, like 15 years now or something. You know, a lot of people point to Invisible Walls as like the first modern gaming podcast or at least a template for a lot of podcasts that would follow after. Epic Battle Axe was right there alongside us, man. Like, I think we did launch Invisible Walls a little bit before Epic Battle Axe. 
Um, but they had done it for a really long time, and they were one of the OGs of gaming podcasts as well. So major props to them. And again, they're great people. I've loved working with them throughout the years. And we have even stayed in contact a little bit since I've launched Sifted to see if we could do something. It never really worked out or whatever. I'm asking how we got connected with them at Game Trailers. That was all Daniel Kaiser. So that's where Daniel Kaiser, DK, as we like to call him, that's kind of where he came from. Um, he had been working with like those guys like off and on leading up to him coming on at Game Trailers and being talent for us. And so that was all him. He kind of managed that relationship too. Like he made sure that they were delivering the podcast on time every week. He would, you know, he would alert me and be like, okay, it's coming in, blah, 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 get ready to publish, all that kind of stuff. But he would do a lot of the management of that whole situation because obviously he was also on the podcast. Um, so anyway, major props to those guys. It is truly an end of an era. Um, and I don't know what they're planning to do in the future, but I hope it's doing something in games. Um, it is a shame that one of the original gaming podcasts weren't, wasn't able to survive um, until 2023, but I wish them all good luck and congratulations on all their success. Hi Next up, we have a question from Joaquim Dragoon. In your entire career, have you ever had to step in and stop discrimination in the office or had to defend anyone from ill treatment? All right, I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but my staff at Game Trailers was extremely diverse. I mean, we literally had people working with us from every part of the globe. At least, you know, their ancestors were from different parts of the globe. They were all Americans. But, um, and it wasn't even that it was like a conscious decision I made. It's just the, it, it just happened organically. It's the team that I wanted. I wanted a, a diverse team because you bring in people from different cultures. They have different perspectives on things. And the way that we handled reviews at Game Trailers while I was there was that it was a team effort. Like we would review games or we'd get a review in from a freelancer or whatever. And we'd all sit down and we'd talk about it. And I saw over and over again the cultural influences impacting how people perceived video games. And so I felt it very important to make sure that there were different voices in the room. And so I did that. These were just the people that I hired. When we would put out the casting call, I'd talk to like 100 people, I'm not <laughs> exaggerating, and these were the people that I hired. And we ended up having this extremely diverse group. And to answer your question, no. No one would ever mess with my guys. <laughs> <laughs> my guys were the engine that ran game trailers. Like nobody messed with them. They, everybody there knew that where the hand was that was feeding everybody. And it was me and my team. We were the ones creating the content. Without that, there's nothing. And so people were very respectful of my team there. There was never a problem like that where people were harassed over the race or sexual orientation or any of that crap. It would not stand. Just believe me, if anything like that happened, Shane would be coming breathing fire. So, no, that has never happened. Now, I have dealt with issues where co-workers have been treated poorly, and most of that relates to Morgan Webb. <laughs> going, like, to E3 with her and shooting with her, like, going from location to location inside E3 to shoot stuff, she was just harassed constantly. And, like, we never had, like... A problem where someone tried to grope her or anything like that, but you got people who were invading her personal space or were badgering her when she had her five minute break after working five hours on a hot show floor. Like stuff like that happened all the time, or just creepers just following you around like everywhere you went, just staring at her. There are lots of times where she was made to feel uncomfortable working in the games industry in the capacity that she did. I'll just put it to you that way. And so as a producer, and that's part of your job as a producer in television or anywhere in any type of video production, part of your job is to take care of your talent, to make sure they're not being harassed and they aren't made to feel uncomfortable because one, it's awful, but two, you also get terrible performances from the talent when that happens. So um, it wasn't just me who had to walk around and take care of Morgan at various shoots. It was all the producers who worked on X-Play or who worked on G4. Um, and if you've ever worked with an attractive girl as talent, it's a problem. And it wasn't even just E3. Like there was one time I went to Las Vegas for one of 2K's NHL games and they had built like a fake ice rink out in on the strip in Vegas that had this crazy material that pe they could actually skate on. And the crazy part was the person I had to defend the talent from was Alex Ovechkin. You're not into hockey. You may still know who Alex Ovechkin is. He's like, he's about to beat Gretzky's like all-time goal record. Like, 
he is one of like the prodigies from like 15 or 20 years ago when Sidney Crosby came in the league and Malkin and all these superstars came in the league. He was one of them and he was awful. He hit on my talent the whole night, gave her his phone number when we went to leave, wouldn't leave her alone. So it's not just the fans you have to protect talent from. Sometimes it can be the people that you're actually interviewing. All right, our last question for today's episode comes from, of course, you should guess it, Kevin, because he has a question in every episode, and this is the last question, so we had to get in there. And the cool part is he has another list of rapid-fire questions for me. Hey, Shane, I have another list of rapid-fire questions for you. Handheld or mobile games? Steelers or Penguins winning? A remake of Ocarina of Time or Super Mario 64? Stranger Things or The Walking Dead? Italian or Japanese food? Vodka and Red Bull or beer? House music or hip-hop? G4 or game trailers? Relaxing or historical vacation? Subtitles or no subtitles? Okay, we're just going to take them in order. I'm going to try to get to these as quickly as I can. First one up, handheld or mobile games? Handheld all the way. (laughs) Although, I'll be honest with you, the, the real answer to that question is neither. I... I used to play games a lot when I would travel and fly, but I have to play them so much now um, that I want to break when I take vacation from playing video games. Back when I used to do that was when I worked at game trailers and like I didn't have to play everything. I could more pick and choose the stuff that I wanted to play because I was the editor in chief. And some of it, too, is I just wanted to give, you know, my employees the ability to play and review some big games. They needed that experience. So I wasn't just like constantly having to like play games all the time back then. So playing on a plane I'm like oh I want to play some more of this new Mario game like now my vacations I need time away from games so if I do have to choose it is handheld I'll take my switch or whatever I literally hardly ever never play mobile games next Steelers or Penguins winning um (sighs) this changes by year (laughs) or at least it changes like every five years um if you had asked me eight years ago, it would have been Penguins. But then the Penguins went on a tear um, where they were kind of a dynasty and they won a bunch of Stanley Cups in a row. Almost, they, Well, they went back to back and then won another one. So it, the answer is Steelers because the Steelers, I mean, I know people just assume that the Steelers just win all the time. They really haven't. Like they haven't had a losing record in like, 17 years or something like that so they don't technically lose but they're not winning anything like they haven't won a playoff game in six years and that's despite pretty much making the playoffs every year so um, even though in my lifetime the Steelers have six Super Bowls and the Penguins in my lifetime have five cups it's still I'm still rooting for the Steelers right now it's been a long time since the Steelers have really done anything um, we are lucky we didn't have to go through a crazy rebuild. Somehow they managed to avoid that, but it, it's time to start winning. So definitely Steelers. Um, next up, a remake of Ocarina of Time or Super Mario 64, man. I mm, I guess I would say I'm going to make my choice based on the game that I think would benefit the most from being remade. And to me, that's Ocarina of Time. Um, Super Mario 64 I feel like, you know, Mario's art style kind of lends itself to low polygon counts. It works. It's a flat shaded game. It's a game that, you know, adding some polygons or some shaders, I don't know that it helps the game all that much. Ocarina of Time has a big draw distance. It's a pseudo open world game. It has big empty fields in it that could be populated. I mean, the game could be made to look so much better Do I think gameplay-wise it could be improved? Maybe a little bit. Um, I think Super Mario 64's gameplay is perfect as is. It doesn't need to be touched. So my answer is Ocarina of Time because I believe a remake would help that game more than Super Mario 64. Um, Let's see, Stranger Things or The Walking Dead. That's an easy one, Stranger Things. And that's just simply supply and demand. There's just too much Walking Dead. Like, now there's... How many spinoff shows are there right now? Like, four? There's, like, the new one... Um, let's see. That's one, two, there's three, I think. There's just too much. Walking Dead. Like, I have, I didn't even, I've even watched, like, the last few episodes of the mainline Walking Dead at this point. I finally reached burnout, and I haven't watched hardly any of the, I've watched Fear the Walking Dead for a couple seasons, but now I don't care about that anymore. The two other new spinoffs, one is just about to launch for Daryl, don't care about that. Um, So it's easy for me, Stranger Things. There's just been way fewer episodes, and so therefore, just organically, um, I'm ready for more Stranger Things versus more Walking Dead. Um, Italian or Japanese food? Now, I am Italian. Um, My mother's maiden name is Carini, and my grandfather and, and his parents 
came through Ellis Island from Italy, um, immigrated through Ellis Island. So I'm more Italian than Japanese, obviously, but that doesn't mean that I like Italian food more. I do love Italian food. And when you say Japanese food, I think most people say like sushi. I'm not a big sushi guy. Like I'll eat it, but I don't really like it. And because I don't like it, I'm like, why would I pay so much money for something I don't absolutely love? So I don't eat a ton of sushi, but there's other Japanese foods that I absolutely love. I love ramen. I love Japanese barbecue. Um, so I guess I would say Italian. Like if, if I could only eat something for a week, would I choose Japanese food or Italian food? I would choose Italian food because... Like, the first few days, I'd be fine with Japanese food, but then I'd have to start diving into some of the more obscure stuff, and I think that's where I might fall off. So, Italian food for me, uh, vodka Red Bull or beer, vodka Red Bull all the way. Um, beer makes me tired and sleepy, and I don't really drink that much anymore. I only drink when I go out to hear a band or to hear a DJ or something like that. And when I do that stuff, I don't want to be tired. I don't want to be sitting down, sipping my beer. I want to be up. I want to be energetic. Vodka Red Bull is great for that. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. Again, don't do it if you want a chill night out at the bar or whatever. But if you want to have some fun with friends, I highly recommend Vodka Red Bull um, and Grey Goose if you can afford it, obviously. Um, house music or hip-hop? House music um, right next to me is a big wall of records. I loved hip-hop when it was innocent back in the 80s when hip-hop was about breakdancing and graffiti um, and stuff like that. And songs were funny and fun, and they told a story. Hip-hop just got too angry for me, and now I don't even really understand it anymore. Like, I just discovered a song by Lil Yachty <laughs> that I really like called The Ride, but everybody that loves Lil Yachty hates it. They're <laughs> like, it's the worst song he ever made, because it's not really hip-hop. It's more of, like, downbeat, like, electronic music. Um, I've really struggled to find modern hip-hop acts that I really like or resonate with. And a lot of it is I just can't res resonate with them as a person. Obviously, I'm a huge Beastie Boys fan. They kind of come from the same cloth as me. They were in the punk and hardcore scene, and then you know they were, then they turn into hip-hop, but you still get those shades of their old selves in their music, so that makes a little more sense for me. Uh, but it's house. It's I mean, I hardly ever listen to hip-hop anymore. If any of you guys know good hip-hop, Put them down in the comments below. I'm all about like experimenting and finding new music and things like that. But I try. I've had people tell me like, run the jewels. And I'm like, they're okay. Like, I, I really struggled to find hip hop stuff that I like here in the last like 10 or 15 years. So house music all the way there. Um, G4 or game trailers. That's like picking like my favorite child. Like, I don't even feel comfortable making a choice there because it to me, it's not about like the job. It's about the people. Um, and I don't want to, like, pick, like, who are my favorite people that I worked with. I love them all. Um, and so I'm not going to make a choice there. They were both awesome. Is that fair? That's as much as I'm going to say, I think. Um, relaxing, or historical, relaxing or historical vacations. I've talked about this before, I think, on Ask Shane Anything. I am not a lay-by-the-beach guy when I go on vacation. I can do that. My wife has no interest in it at all. So I'm only kind of interested in it. She's not interested in it at all. So we just don't do it. All our vacations that we go on, and we don't get to go on them very often, but when we do, uh, it's always someplace where we can learn something while we're on vacation. We're both very interested in history and things like that. So um, definitely more historical versus lounging. I mean, you got to remember, I live in LA. If I want to go lay on the beach, I could literally hop on my bicycle right now and be down there in 10 minutes and lay on the beach. So that's it's funny living someplace where a lot of people come for vacation. There's a million things about it that's really bizarre. And that's one of them. Um, and then finally, subtitles or no subtitles. I am 100 percent no subtitles guy. And I'll just be honest with you. It is crazy to me. I actually tweeted this a couple weeks ago. Or maybe I put it up on uh, um, on Blue Sky was that. It's crazy how many games, like when you turn the subtitles off, the subtitles still come on. It's so simple. But for whatever reason, like half of the games that I play, I go into the menus and I turn off subtitles and they still display anyway. It is bizarre. I don't know why so many games do this. I have no clue. It drives me bonkers. Like our B-roll for Game Face. Like I don't want subtitles in it. I know you guys do because you can't hear the audio on Game Face. And if you're watching a cutscene, you kind of want to know what's going on. It's just my OCD. It drives me nuts. If the like the text from the subtitles is like running underneath our lower thirds and it gets jambled, like I hate it. Like I just want the clean image of the gameplay and our lower third. And if I could take off the HUD, I would do that as well. I'm all about the aesthetics of Game Face. What does it look like at all times? Um, and so I try to turn off subtitles any chance I get. If I'm playing games 
while listening to podcasts, which you might be doing right now with this with this podcast in Baldur's Gate three. Sometimes I'll turn on the subtitles um, if I want to make sure I know I'm no so I know what's going on in the cutscenes and things like that, so I can follow the story. Uh, but a lot of times when a cutscene comes up and I'm listening to a podcast, I turn off the podcast and turn off the TV so I can hear it. So for me, no subtitles. Hi-ya! All right, that's it for this week's episode of Ash Ain't Anything. I hope you guys are having fun playing through Baldur's Gate 3 if you have a decent PC. The truth is you don't even really need a decent PC because I don't. And I'm able to play it on my PC. It's truly like a technical marvel in that way. Uh, but I hope you guys are having a good weekend filled with games. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday for Game Face. Um, looking like we'll have some actually some pretty decent games in that show which i'm kind of surprised about um again this show is a reward for those of you who pledge at the ash chain tier or higher that's seven dollars or more per month anybody who pledges at four dollars or more per month gets to watch the show but the people who are pledging at that ash chain tier they have a much higher percentage or a higher chance of getting their questions in the show and while we're at that why not go to sifted.net right now if you're watching this on Patreon and ask me a question. There's a link up in the header at sifted.net. Just click on it. It'll take you to our forum and you can ask away. You can ask 24 hours a day, 365. In fact, I'm thinking about maybe changing our question procedure for Pactor Factor and kind of doing the same thing where we just have this thread that lives forever and you guys can go and ask questions anytime you want. Again, if that's something you might be interested in, leave that down in the comments below. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday. Game face.